So back at the end of, the, of August, um, I challenged some of you with a teaching of mine, um, a teaching on the non-existent chapter 29 of the book of Acts. So if you, if you look at chapter uh, 29 in the book of Acts, you're not going to find it, so don't go there. So uh, my charge to you was that the story of the history of the church is not finished. And that we, the church, we actually finish the book of Acts with our being brought into the kingdom of God as redeemed followers of Jesus and heirs to that kingdom. And then we participate in that kingdom by demonstrating and proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ. So I only scratched the surface of the amount of teaching that can be done on the kingdom of God. And so this sermon is going to bring a little bit more teaching on that subject. And because I really feel that it's important to understand as followers of Jesus that your faith isn't just a personal expression. Um, that you're, you're part of something greater than your personal relationship with Christ. That you, your involvement, it's something greater than the invo- your involvement here in this church. And it's even something greater than just... Christianity as a whole, that you're part of a kingdom. I should also point out that this idea of a kingdom, it's it's really kind of a hard concept for us as as Americans because um, in our American culture, I understand that there's some who are, you know, (laughs) come from a different uh, European culture, but in our American culture, we're sort of, we've got this anti-king an anti-kingdom that's been ingrained in us for, uh, for well over 200 years now. But Jesus came... Do we have that PowerPoint? Is that working? Jesus came to establish a kingdom. Regardless of our cultural dislikes of kingdoms, he made it plain that one of his primary purposes here was to establish the kingdom. The kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is God's kingdom. He is king. He is the creator of it. He is the ruler of it. He he is the Lord of his kingdom. God had made, he has made uh, his kingship known even before Christ. We read in in Isaiah, it says, I am the Lord, your, your holy one. The creator of Israel. I'm your king. And then, and then Jesus says this. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus has come to establish a kingdom. Nor will they say, look, here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus is literally He's literally the kingdom itself, and he is the ruler of it. He is the example of this kingdom's greatest citizen. He also says this in Luke 8, soon after he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. So Jesus comes to declare this kingdom and to be the kingdom. But what is this kingdom? So the word kingdom itself can be defined as a realm or a region which, of something that is dominant. But according to this definition, wherever God is dominant, he, is, he, is also, he also rules. He is, he is the king. But where is God's dominion? For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over all the nations, it says in Psalm 22. That would mean that all nations under all creation which He made are subject to His authority. Huh. Is that really true? I mean, that brings into some questions. This kingly rule is not just exercised over nations and governments, but it's, it should be also on the macro level, under our daily lives as people. Dallas Willard defines God's kingdom as the range of his effective will 
Where he wants done, it's done. Furthermore, there's a New Testament scholar. His name is Mark Strauss. These are guys I had to read when I was in seminary. And I bring them to you now. God's kingdom is not so much a realm, but it's a reign. It is his sovereign dominion over all things. But the more we, dwell, we dwell, delve into this idea of a kingdom, the, our, from our earthly per perspective, it just it brings up more questions. And, and you're probably thinking of some of those now. Like, how does that work? If God reigns, why, why is there so much evil? And, and why is the kingdom only in process? Why, why not just take back the earth right now? It's because it's so complex, this idea of the kingdom of God, and it, it just becomes rarely talked about in churches. We'd rather stick to personal applications. We'd rather see how Jesus relates to me rather than what my place is in this sovereign reign and how his character plays an important part in what the kingdom looks like. So I'm here today to challenge you a little bit. Whether you came here or not, that's what I'm here to do and uh, to ready to be challenged. So if you really, and, and if you really study this and you take this stuff seriously and you take the life of Jesus seriously, you have to become, you have to take into account that Jesus said a lot about the kingdom, okay? It's, he, he mentions the kingdom over a hundred times in the New Testament alone. And Jesus teaches often on the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and the two terms are actually mutually exclusive. So he teaches a lot on this, and we have to pay attention to that. Our gospel reading for today was out of Matthew 13, and if you don't have it in front of you, I'd encourage you to open it up. We're going to take out five specific parts out of that fairly long passage. I'm not going to preach on the whole passage. Um, there are five metaphors or parables that Jesus uses to describe the kingdom of God. Or metaphors. Go back to high school English. If you're not familiar with metaphors, it's a, it's a common literary device that describes something that may be may hard to, understand, uh, to describe, something that's hard to understand from your personal point of view. A metaphor uses the word like very often as a connecting point um, to, to make, it, uh, make things known. So A is like B, therefore A and B are alike. They're, they're similar. So if I was to say to you, it, so if I was to say to you that I'm, I'm having chest pains, I'm not really having chest pains right now, it's okay, relax. Uh, but if I was to say to you, I'm having chest pains, I might say, my chest hurts so bad, it's like a 400 pound person is standing on me. Now, now, you can know maybe a little bit of what the pain I'm going through, which I'm not, but you can understand that pain a little bit because of the metaphor I just used. So I use this metaphor to explain, um, to give you a picture, to give you a visual, something tangible to help you understand. So in Matthew chapter 3, we have, uh, 13, I'm sorry, uh, we have several, um, the kingdom of God is like to help us understand a very complex and intangible concept by comparing and contrasting the kingdom into things we can, we can understand. So we have this. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's verse 31. The kingdom of God is like yeast or leaven. It's in verse 33. The kingdom of God is like a hidden treasure. In verse 30, 44. The kingdom of God is like a merchant searching for fine pearls, verse 45. And then the kingdom of God is like a fishing net, in verse 47. Five metaphors, and the, and the entire chapter of 13 actually has some more metaphors of that. But for the sake of time, and because it is such a complex topic, I chose to sort of limit it to these five. And these are five metaphors that give us a quick glance into any core um, into the how it relates to the kingdom and you might be thinking to yourself how does these things 
How does mustard seeds and leaven and buying pearls and merchant and hidden treasure, what does that have anything to do with kingdoms or kings? You're about to find out. So looking at verse 31, it says this. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. So mustard seed is certainly not one of the smallest seeds, not one of the smallest known seeds, but in Jesus' time, it was actually one of the smallest seeds, and it was an extremely beneficial seed, important to their culture. And it's important to remember that metaphors don't often need to be literal. Um, But the visual is what drives the truth of it when you're trying to explain something using a metaphor or a parable. So the mustard seed is indeed very small, um, and it and it doesn't really become a tree, but sort of. It, it's it's actually a really large shrub. Sorry, I didn't get a picture for you, but if you, you Google actually the black mustard tree seed, uh, back black mustard tree, uh, that's what you'd find, and it's kind of a really really tall uh, shrub. And the black mustard tree was likely the picture that the first century Jew had in mind when Jesus mention, mentions a mustard seed. Um, Its seed is very small, and it grows quickly into this large shrub, as I just said. The mustard seed, uh, the mustard tree is used as an herb to enhance taste. Um, It's not quite like the mustard that you squirt on your hot dog, uh, but it's, uh, the seed itself is used for flavoring, sort of like when Jesus talks about um, being the salt of the earth. So it's kind of a similar visual. Uh, But it's also used for medicinal purposes. It was used for healing and particularly gut health and digest to aid as digestion. So this is what a first century Jew would have had in mind. But why is this important to the explanation of the kingdom of God? Unlike some parables, an explanation here isn't really offered by Jesus. Some of the parables are and some of them aren't. So we're left to interpret what this actually means. As true with the rest of some of these metaphors we're about to talk about. The size of the seed isn't what really matters. So the kingdom here in this metaphor, the kingdom starts small. Small like a mustard seed. Jesus is one man. And he came into the earth humble and lowly. Just like a seed. And the message of Jesus can have small beginnings in our lives and in the lives who, of people who receive that word and, and, and have real effect in those who actually humble themselves and lower themselves and understand their actual insignificance apart from the grace of God. Without God and His grace, we're just we're small. Amen? The work of the gospel is small. Jesus healed individuals and and he worked with mostly small crowds. That's just what we see. We didn't see a lot. I mean, there were a few large group gatherings, but a lot of what he does is on a a micro level. The kingdom of God just started with a few people. He had 12 people that he worked with mostly and very intently. And of those 12, there were three that he worked even more intently with. And the kingdom of God was, didn't come into the world gloriously. It entered into the world small. As small as a baby coming into the world. That's why the message of Christmas coming up is so important. Here, I said it. It's, it's just around the corner. Christmas is coming. I saw snow in the forecast. Oh, no, no. But the message of Christmas is important to understand the humble and small beginnings of God's kingdom. And kings are often seen as majestic and glorious, but our King Jesus was lowly and humble, and and he healed those who are lowly and humble and broken. And those seeds grow into a large tree. And that's how the kingdom of God grows. And don't be discouraged, guys. Don't be discouraged when, when those small things that God's doing in your life 
don't seem to produce the kind of things, the results that you're looking for now. Okay? Lean into what God is doing and lean into maybe the simple prayers that come to your heart and the little things that you're doing to bless others um, because God's going to grow that into a large tree. Large tree that is His kingdom. In verse 33, it says this. He told them still another parable, another metaphor. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. So almost every week, every Wednesday, Pastor John, he makes bread. The bread that we had today for communion. He Every Wednesday afternoon, almost every Wednesday. And um, the bread... Um, this is leavened bread, uh, bread that rises so that, um, but you can, you can take, you know, you could put all the ingredients in for this bread. If you wanted to do this on a Wednesday, he, he loves for people to come and watch him and, te and teach you how to make that bread. But if you were to get all those ingredients right, just down to the T, and uh, for those engineers in the room, you like, you know, precise things, Okay. You can follow all the steps exactly right to make perfect bread. But if one small step is left out, that process of adding yeast is left out, you just get flat, doughy, dense bread that's just not very good. And, and often every week when he makes this, it's kind of a, you know, what's the yeast going to do this time, you know? The kingdom of God is like yeast mixed into flour. You can do all the right things in your life. You can follow all the rules. You can strive to be the best person possible, but without that one added ingredient, it's just not right. Jesus is like yeast. It's that added ingredient to your life that makes things right. Otherwise, it's just good works. It's just rule following Jesus comes in from the outside, just like yeast. He was begotten of the Father, not made. He was God-made flesh. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He works His way into your life, and He just fundamentally changes things, like flour and all the ingredients for bread. When the yeast is added, that's, that's what makes a difference. And that's how yeast works. And, and that's how your faith rises. That's, that's how the kingdom will rise. Your faith in Christ is a part of that kingdom. And like yeast, and through, like, like yeast, and through you, God is going to um, bless the church. And, and through the church, and through you, and through the church, it's, it'll spread slowly throughout the world. Just like yeast. It mixes with the rest of the dough and gives life meaning and purpose to everything. The kingdom starts small, like a seed. And the kingdom is infectious, like yeast. Yeast is bacteria, if you didn't know that, and it, and it spreads like that. And faith in Christ will invade every part of your life if you let Him. Small. And infectious. Let's look at verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy went. And then in his joy, he went and he sold all that he had and bought that field. So it's easy in a passage like this to sort of get, on, get stuck on the ethical and the moral implications of the man's actions. You might be saying, hey, Pastor Chris, if he knew that there was a treasure, why didn't he just go to the owner and, uh, and do the right thing and tell the owner of the field? Um, at least those of you who are, who are rule followers, that's probably what you're thinking. But that's not the point of the metaphor. I'm trying to, if I'm trying to explain why my chest pains for comparing a 400-pound person standing on my chest, you don't ask... If I was to tell you that, you wouldn't ask me, well, why, is this, why was a 400-pound person standing on your chest? That's not the point of the metaphor. 
hopefully you would say, wow, that was, that must, you're, you must really having bad chest pains. That must hurt really bad. So that's the point of the metaphor, not the fact that I'm comparing it to something that's ridiculous. So Jesus here is comparing the kingdom of God to a treasure in a field. He's talking about something that's just not easily found. It's not in plain sight. The gospel needs to be preached. It needs to be proclaimed. It needs to be taught. It needs to be witnessed, folks. Amen? It, it's, this is why we proclaim is considered, being considered as one of our guiding values. We can't we can't just serve. We also have to teach the gospel, which is in, often in plain sight. The gospel is not a human construct or a or sociological need. It wasn't dreamed up to make people happy. It's backwards thinking. The kingdom is a backwards kingdom. A king doesn't die so that people can live. It's usually the other way around. The king sends out people to die so that he can live. But Jesus died so people can live. And when the Holy Spirit leads you in this way, you'll understand that there's a cost. The gospel isn't available, isn't available for all to for all for just for the taking. It's like a treasure hidden in the field that is purchased. It's purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. The man's actions here are also equally important. He sold everything that he had. He did it grudgingly and complaining and grumbling, right? Is that what it says? No, it says, it says that he sold everything he had. In his joy he went and sold everything that he had. He was joyful. And the point is also emphasized in this next verse, in 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had, and he bought it. So with joy, he gave up his life for something of greater worth. The kingdom of God is giving your life for is worth giving your life for. Amen? It's, and it costs you something. It's going to cost. Did you stumble on, this, on the treasure of God um, in the least likely place? Maybe that's some of your story in here. It is mine. I came across the gospel when I was 18. I had been going to church. I had been hearing the gospel for many, many years, but it wasn't until I came across people who gave their life for it with joy. And they had something worth listening to at that point. And that's when I gave up my life for Christ. And somebody, some people's testimony is often... Um, Man, my life was terrible, and until I came to know Jesus, he put it all back together. But it's a, it's a whole different story. When you feel like your whole life is all together and put, put together well, and you give it to Christ, and he takes it apart, and he says, no, I'm going to give you a different way of looking at things. There's a cost. Maybe you came across this treasure of the gospel through a conversation with a friend, or maybe the love of a relative, or maybe the compassion from somebody here in this church. Maybe that's part of your story and how you found that treasure in the field. Are you holding on to a life that you desire, even if, you're, um, even if you haven't, um, even if you found this treasure, even if you know in your head this treasure, are you holding on to that life? Understand that it costs. And maybe it's time to sell some stuff. The kingdom starts small. It's infectious. And it's not what or where you think it might be. And it costs. Lastly, 
47 through 50. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into a lake and caught all kinds of fish. And when it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore and they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's just a hard passage to read. And we often don't like to hear these passages that Jesus because it just sounds mean. But this is a picture of the kingdom we just don't want to hear about because we live in a culture that both, I would think, secretly likes to judge people on, online and you know, you know, behind a Facebook profile. But publicly, we, we don't want to judge anybody. And everyone, and we want to believe that everybody just makes it in the end. Unless, of course, you're really, 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 really bad. Which none of us are, right? Yeah. But this metaphor, very applicable to Jesus' original audience because many of them were fishermen. Many fished like this with a drag net off the back of their boat. Um, so this would have been a very, very vivid picture for them. The picture brings us to the fulfillment of the kingdom. So we've seen its beginnings, small with humility. We've seen, um, we've seen how it's found, that it's not usually in plain sight. We've seen that it costs to enter and the death of Christ and our, and our death to ourselves. However, the cold, hard truth is that not all will gain entrance to the kingdom. And that breaks my heart. It won't be for lack of trying on the part of many faithful saints, some of you in this room, and the work of the Holy Spirit, but ultimately our God, our God, He's not a forceful God. And there will, there will be some, despite having heard the truth of the gospel and processed it in their head, but haven't received it in their heart despite having seen the demonstration of the church at work, despite having given an invitation to respond to the love of Christ, they will turn and choose their own kingdom over the kingdom of the one true God and the creator of all things. Why? Because it started too small and they wanted something bigger. Or because it didn't infect their hearts. Or because they didn't see it. It was hidden, or because it just cost too much. But nevertheless, this passage says that Jesus will, he will pull that net onto the shore and he will judge. And the good fish will be collected and the bad fish will be tossed back into the sea because bad fish, in reality, in, real, in, in their time, those bad fish were diseased. They often didn't have fins and, and the note, their scales were bad. They were diseased. And so they were thrown away, not put back into the sea. They were thrown away. And the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is not a kingdom unless, I said it before, his sovereign dominion is over all things. That means each of us here, sitting in this room, and many out there, are gathered to be kingdom citizens. We don't know who the good fish and the bad fish are most of the time. Even sitting here as your pastor, I, I can't really know all of your hearts and where you are at before the Lord. But God knows. And, and there are some who believe that to make God's kingdom known, you have to separate from the world. You have to, you know, build a fortress. You have to make it plain who's in and who's out so that you're not infected by the diseased fish or the bad goats. You know what? God's kingdom has no, is not a fortress. It has no fortress for the church to hide. In regular kingdoms, there's usually a castle or a fortress. That's not God's kingdom. There's no fortress. He told us to be in the world and not of the world, a light in the darkness. And so until that day of judgment when those who are 
declared righteous by Christ, not by their works, and are separated by those who aren't, we will not know who God may bring into that kingdom. So until then, no one's written off. We will treat all with dignity, honor, and respect because judgment is for the Lord. And until that day, we preach Christ and His kingdom. Amen? You know, but maybe for some of you, some of here, you're not sure of your place in the kingdom. And that's okay. And that's okay. Keep asking those questions. And, and I pray that those of us who are sure of it would treat you with in, dignity, honor, and respect and love you. And for those of you who by faith are sure of what you've hoped for and certain of what you don't see, we are kingdom people and we're called to honor the small ways in which God is building his kingdom that one day will be much, much greater than we understand even now. And we're called to understand this backwards kingdom and how it's built and how it's built on broken people and, and not with glory and might, but in humility. And that it's infectious and it works its way into people's hearts little by little. And we're called to demonstrate that and proclaim the good news so that others may see and know what is in plain sight, what is not in plain sight. We make it in plain sight. We know that the gospel cost us our lives because Jesus' death is our death. And his life is our life. And that's what it means to be a kingdom citizen. Amen.